I believe we did. Uh, did it not work? I'm not seeing it. Oh no, oh my God. Uh, no, I do see it, okay. We've, yeah, we've been live for a few minutes. We have, There's, okay. Okay, uh, <laughs> thank you. And uh, Avery, are you keeping an eye on the, on the chat tonight? Yeah, I'm, oh, okay. Apparently when you view it from the, from the normal account, it uh, doesn't show up. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. <laughs> Obviously, being astrophysicists, we're not extraordinarily tech savvy unless it's to do with terminal. Then I have your back. <laughs> <laughs> but just don't trust me on Windows. I can't. I can't do that. Um. <laughs> All right. So, how many uh, viewers do we currently have? Just to just to check in. If you have uh, there's only about twenty six right now. Let's give it maybe one more minute. Thank you guys all for tuning in. I hope you're enjoying our uh, beginning of the show sort of introductions. Mm -hmm. uh, we just want to make sure we, we don't jump into things uh, too early because it always takes some people a minute to find this to find this live stream. Don't want to be too rude, but to keep things interesting, I mean, we can talk about things that we're currently looking at or things that we're interested in space. I mean, obviously, other than general relativity, y'all are about to get a full earful of that. Um, <laughs> But I've been working on the Turbo Telescope with the professor here at the university, Pat Kelly. And it's a fun project because it actually uses commercial telescopes where if you have a spare couple thousand dollars, you can go and recreate this at your own home, uh, except for the catting that we've had to do for it and the, the thousands of dollars. But you can if you want to. And I've been focusing on image subtraction, which means I have been spending way too many hours staring at very pixelated images and wondering, are they just the right amount of pixelated? And the answer other than a couple days ago <laughs> was no, because apparently if your reference image is bad, your product is bad. I mean, who would have thunk me? I should have, but I do now. <laughs> Uh, but that's the learning curve of science. You spend a couple weeks doing something and then you realize that it was just a just a small error the whole time. That's the that, honestly kind of the fun part about it. Oh yeah, been there. <laughs> yeah, so that was, uh, okay. I, I hope that was interesting for people because that was that's sort of part of our goal with these with these talks is to give sort of a peek behind the, cur uh, the curtain of what happens in scientific research. Uh, that said, I do want to move on to the talk since it's a few minutes past eight now and I want to make sure people don't wait too long. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're talking about general relativity today and, oh, sorry. I'll pass it on over to Avery so you can, they can introduce the topics and everything like that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, obviously we're talking about general relativity and you, uh, and it's, we're gonna really focus on a lot of uh, what we see on earth when it comes to do with general relativity. So we're gonna have a brief overview first and then Max is gonna go into uh, the basics of general relativity and how that really impacts something that a lot of you probably use every day, uh, that being GPS and GIS. And then we're gonna look at some of the experiments uh, that we use to measure the effects of general relativity. Specifically, we're gonna talk about uh, LIGO, we're gonna talk about the pound Rebka experiment, and we're gonna talk about the Gravity B probe. And hopefully, hopefully you learn a little bit about um, that from these. And then we'll obviously go into some questions. If anyone has anything, feel free to throw it in at any point, any point today in the uh, chat window, and we'll keep track of those. And then I'll go through some activities, which any of you can uh, go through on your own on the web. I've provided links in the, in the bottom of the description. And then if we have time, we can go through some more questions. All righty. Well, without further ado, Let's get into what general relativity is, because it's, it's usually good practice to know what you're doing before we get into doing it. You don't have to, but it's good practice. So what is general relativity? I'm going to give a very brief overview, focusing on the aspects of general relativity that have to do with what we're going to be talking about today, which is mostly, at least for the parts that I'm going to be talking about, time dilation. Um, now, in order to talk about general relativity, now my first point is all about Einstein because we wouldn't have this if it weren't for Einstein, or at, least, or at least it would have had to be someone else discovering these things. And so the theory of special relativity, theory of general relativity, those are both theories from Einstein. So it's always a little fun to actually see why he's such a big name in the community. Now, in order to talk about general relativity, I have to explain two other things first. So just bear with me there. I gotta explain what the heck relativity is because that's 
We can't get general before we get the first thing. And then I have to explain special relativity because we like to be counterintuitive and special relativity came before general relativity. All right, so what is relativity? Well, let's imagine that you are standing at the side of a road. Now, obviously that's a little dangerous, but don't worry, later on, we're going to be standing next to a black hole. So this is, this is nothing compared to that. Now, if you're standing on the side of the road, you're watching cars go by. Let's say a car is going at 60 miles an hour. Now, according to your reference frame, meaning your point of view, it is going 60 miles an hour. Now, let's change this a little bit. Let's say you're not from Minnesota over here and you're driving on 94. So you're probably going 60 and everyone else is going around 75. Now, in that frame, you are no longer stationary. You are going 60 miles an hour. But compared to yourself, you are stationary. So when looking at those cars going 75, it actually, to you, looks like they're going 15 miles an hour. You minus the two velocities. Now, that's the general idea of what relativity is. Basically, that look observing something depends on where you are and how fast you're moving when you're observing it. It all depends on the observer. I mean, you hear that thrown around all the time if you're thinking like Schrodinger's cat or other more quantum level things like that. So, all right, now let's go into special relativity. Special relativity was a theorem by Einstein that helped resolve some of the problems that we had in physics. One of the easiest ways to explain this is a lot of us know that you can't go faster than the speed of light. I mean, we like to throw that around all the freaking time. Now, let's throw in a little experiment here. Let's say I have a constant velocity. I mean, well, a constant force going on something. So anything other than a constant velocity. What do I mean by a constant force? I mean that I have something that I'm pushing to go faster and faster and faster. Now, as time goes on and on and on, I will go closer to the speed of light. And if it wasn't for special relativity, I would actually go faster than the speed of light. But According to the theory of special relativity, those equations get a little bit more complicated and they compensate for this and make it so I'm always going closer and closer and closer, but never actually reaching the speed of light. All right, well, that's pretty neat, but what the heck does that have to do with this fancy picture of the sun I have over here? Well, one of the consequences of special relativity is that space and time are actually connected. And it's not just a sci-fi word to hear the phrase space-time. That's actually what we call it. And so being at a different point in space means that you are experiencing time differently. This creates all sorts of phenomena known as time dilation and length contraction, meaning that depending on my speed, I will be going at a different either in a different amount of time, so time will be experienced differently for me, or lengths will be experienced differently for me. Now, that's a lot to wrap your head around, and hopefully these talks will help kind of personalize this a little bit, and especially the activities that Avery has planned later on really should give you an idea for length contraction. But I'm going to be talking mostly about time dilation. Why? Because I think it's really neat. So, all right, we have special relativity. The main thing we're coming from that is that space and time are connected. All right, that's neat and all. But now general relativity. We bring in the idea of acceleration, going faster. Now, the main consequence of general relativity that we're going to be talking about today is that gravity or objects with mass actually bend space and time. And that is how, in a very paraphrased way, objects experienced gravity. Now you can go on and look at many a video on more in-depth explanations, but that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about is how gravity bends space-time. Now let's think about that. Now if space and time are like this plane, and if I'm standing on a flat plane, I experience like just flat ground, I'm just standing. Now let's pretend we're on a hill. Now, the way that I am standing on a hill compared to a plane is different. I have to prop myself up. Depending on if it's a mountain, I might have to be on all fours, hanging on for dear life. So if your normal planes, your normal ground changes how you react to that ground, if standing on a hill is different than standing on just a plane, then wouldn't a hill in space-time feel different? I mean, it stands to reason 
that these things would be different, that if I'm on a curved part of space time as opposed to a flat part of space time, things are gonna change. Space and time will change. So let's get into that. Can we, as my last point says, can we play with space time? Can we have a little fun with this? I mean, physics is all about fun. That's what we try to show you here today. So how do we measure general relativity on Earth? Or how does it influence us on Earth? So the first thing I'm going to be talking about is, well, the first thing in general relativity is general relativity in you, or as I like to call it, GIS pain. GIS is geographical information systems. And one of the key things in that is a GPS, the global positioning system. Now, if you don't know, a GPS um, functions via satellites. You need about four satellites to triangulate your position and you can use your phone or if you're in the before times, you can use maybe a actual dedicated GPS as me and my dad used to do when we were hiking out in the mountains, we'd actually have a GPS so we wouldn't get lost. You'd think that would have actually helped us, but no, we managed to overcome technology. But now you might be thinking, okay, well, science person, what, why, why do you care about GPS? That's geography. Yeah, it's STEM, but why do we care? Well, a satellite is out in orbit. So I got you there. Orbits are in our domain, so we can talk about it. Now, as I said, gravity bends space. Now, if you know a thing or two about gravity, you might know that it's distance dependent. And if you're mathematically inclined, you might care that it's actually over distance squared. Now, what does that mean? It means that the further away I am from an object, the less gravity that I feel. Okay, well, gravity bends space time. So space and time is less bent for these satellites. It has to be. The gravity is less for them. I mean, we've all seen that Canadian on YouTube who's, got, who's out in the ISS. I, I, I apologize, I can never remember their name off the top of my head, but they're floating out there. That's for a little different reason, but their gravity's different. So if their gravity's different, they experience space-time differently. And that's known as gravitational time dilation. And we satellites experience this to such a degree where we actually have to code in time corrections. You see, in points of higher gravity, you experience time slower than compared to points in lower gravity. They will be, so basically a minute on earth could be an hour someplace else that has a higher gravity, or it could be a second in someplace else that has, oh, sorry, oh, my goodness. Now I've misspoken and confused you all. A minute on the earth is, compared to maybe a black hole, a minute at a black hole could be years on earth because the gravity is so much higher compared to here. So we have to correct for that in these satellites. So in order to actually use a satellite, in order for it to make sense and not say that it's daytime when it's actually nighttime, we have to correct for that. So if you ever use your GPS in your day-to-day -day life, you're actually using something that requires knowledge of general relativity. And that's, that's what we're trying to talk about today, how general relativity really influences your day-to-day -day life. It's not just some fancy theory that Einstein had. And, All right, I'm not a physicist. I'm not an astrophysicist. I don't care about. Well, you should. It interacts with your day-to-day -day life. So, okay. Well, Let's go further. Let's have a little more fun. I mean, GPS is neat and all, but you might be going, well, hey there, I use maps. I don't use my GPS. This still doesn't apply to me. Well, okay, then I have something for you. LIGO, which I mean, the acronym speaks for itself, but I guess I can explain that it's the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. I mean, that's a little bit of a mouthful. I suppose those letters could stand for a couple other things in the English language. Now, in order to explain LIGO and why we as astrophysicists really care about it, I kind of have to talk about that image that's on the screen here, where it looks like there's a bunch of waves in a grid. Now, that grid is space and time, because remember, they got to be linked. There's no separating them. And those waves are gravitational waves. How do we theorize that kind of thing? Well, let's think about it. If I can bend space, a lot of people like to uh, make it akin to a trampoline. Well, I can, yeah, I can sit on a trampoline and have it bend, 
but I like to jump on a trampoline. That's a heck of a lot more fun. And what does that do? Well, that makes waves. Or maybe I'm throwing something into water and that makes waves. So if I can make waves in these other planes, let's, let's abuse this analogy. Let's make waves in space and time. Let's ride out the gravitational waves on our surfboard. Now, I really wish we could, but the science isn't there yet. Don't worry, we're working on it. So a gravitational wave is a wave through space-time caused by massive gravitational events and as the image suggests, rotating. Now, you might be thinking, okay, we've been talking about black holes. How do you get more massive than a black hole? Well, all right, here we're going to do a little cheap trick. How about two black holes? Is that more massive for you? Because that's a little more massive for me. So if we have two black holes orbiting each other, they can create gravitational waves. And that's what LIGO observes. It observes these waves in space and time itself. Now, how does it do that? Well, a very basic explanation, and I'm paraphrasing here, is it sends out signals of light in different directions. It then sends these out over massive distances. The way it gets those massive distances is really by reflecting them back and forth. It then receives these signals and adds them together. Now, if the signals are the same, they should add together perfectly, kind of like noise canceling headphones. The waves should cancel and everything is fine and well, but they don't cancel when they experience gravitational waves. And that's how we can determine whether an event of, that produces gravitational waves has occurred. And so now I like to extend that a little bit. I mean, plenty of people who hear about gravitational waves, it's one of the biggest topics in astrophysics right now, hear about LIGO and you go, oh, okay, all right, you're supposed to be peeling back the curtain, not re-explaining something I already know. Well, you might not know this next fact. So just like how LIGO can take in gravitational waves, it can, now this is in theory, produce gravitational waves. Now, it's not the world's greatest producer in the sense of amplitude, but it is in the sense of controlling your output. So we can call LIGO just LIGO. It's a little less fun, so that's why we stick with LIGO. But it would then stand for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Generator, and would actually generate gravitational waves at frequencies that we would want. Now that's pretty neat. You might say, okay, the GPS doesn't apply to me, but this has to apply to you because you're feeling gravitational waves when they occur. And that's, I find quite fascinating. And if you're more and more interested in this, there's also plenty of other talks online, videos you can watch. It's an extraordinary feat of science to be able to measure how time and space is actually not only bent, but waving around. And that's, that's about as sci-fi as we can get in some of these talks. But all right, I've been chatting your ear off by, um, enough by now. I'm going to go turn it on over to Nico here. They're going to be talking about a couple um, experiments that we have. So about to see us all get a little larger here. Um, Thank you, Maxwell. I think you need to enable screen sharing. But also, I want to give you a round of applause while you do that, because that was a fantastic intro to this talk. And I was frankly enraptured and did not, I did not know all of that, frankly, before you started preparing the talk. So, so just to transition to the next part of the talk, uh, what Maxwell just went over is uh, basically a, a lot of ways that uh, general relativity affects us here on the ground, here on Earth, where we live currently. Uh, and can you sh uh, can you see my screen at the moment? Is it sharing correctly? Okay. So, given that the theme of this talk is the theory of general relativity and you, the goal of this talk is to introduce all of the ways that general relativity can affect us on the surface of the Earth and how we measure those effects. Uh, so it's a little bit of sort of fun sci-fi thinking and a lot of the science that goes into driving that sci-fi thinking. So the two we've gone over so far, GPS and LIGO. GPS satellites are in orbit around the Earth. They're in what's called medium Earth orbit. LIGO is on the ground. It's in two cities, uh, one in Washington and one in Louisiana. And there's another uh, observatory like it, Virgo, that is in, I believe, Spain. So all of these things are measuring the way that uh, general relativity warps the space and time that we live in. It's where we are. Uh, so the next two experiments are a little bit less well known. You probably have heard of LIGO if you're tuning into this talk. If not, uh, I hope that was a good introduction because it was very, very enthusiastic and interesting. Uh, 
and you have almost certainly heard of GPS, which is what drives the map on your phone. Here's one you probably haven't heard of, and it is, I, I promise you, just as interesting. And that's called the pound Rebka experiment. It was one of the first ways that we measured general relativity on Earth uh, ever, and it happened in 1960. So to start, to sort of set the scene, uh, one of the things that general relativity does is very akin to the Doppler effect in sound, which is something that we're all familiar with. So that's where I want to start. Uh, when we talk about the Doppler effect, usually the example that's given is if you hear like a fire truck going down the road, you will hear its horn at one frequency. You'll hear like as, as it's going towards you and then as it passes you and it gets lower. Uh, I have no idea how that came across through my microphone. I hope it sounded OK. But that's something we've all been familiar with if we've been in a in, if you've ever been in a major city or just been passed by a motor vehicle of any kind uh the sound gets lower as it passes you so that's less mysterious what's happening is the fire truck in this case is moving towards you and the sound waves that it's emitting get kind of bunched up relative to you because they're all happening sort of one after another in front of the truck but by the time the truck emits the next sound wave it has moved a little closer towards you so the result of that is if it's moving towards you, sound waves appear higher because they are higher frequency because of that bunching effect. Uh, on the other hand, if you're moving away from the fire truck or the fire truck is moving away from you, you will have the opposite effect. You will hear the sound as lower and the sound waves will be more spread out. So that's what you're seeing here visually. Uh, I gave you the sort of sound effect version of it too, so I hope that helped. Uh, this is something that happens as well with light because light can be treated as a wave. So. In exactly the same way as sound has this Doppler shifting effect, light also has a Doppler shifting effect. And it goes by the exact same name, which is very cool. Uh, it also goes by this name, redshift or blue shift, when it's referring to light. A really common thing that we observe in, uh, in astronomy is if something is moving away from us, we will talk about its redshift. And what that means is the light that's coming towards us from this object, if it's standing still, would be a certain frequency, would be perhaps yellow like this. Uh, if it's moving quickly away from us, it thinks it's emitting that yellow. From its perspective, that is still the frequency that it's emitting. But what we see as something moving away from this object, or as something that this object is moving away from, we see a lower frequency of light and a higher wavelength of light. And that is because of the Doppler shift that happens from that motion. So moving away stretches out the waveform and leads to redder light, because redder light has lower wavelengths than bluer light. So take a minute, absorb all of that. Now it gets interesting because none of what we've talked about involves general relativity. The key insight from general relativity is that redshifting of light doesn't just occur from motion. We had known about that for frankly uh, decades by the time that we even invented uh, general relativity or come up with the theory. Uh, what we were really surprised by is that uh, redshifting of light also can occur from powerful sources of gravity. And that is an unintuitive conclusion, because if you have ever held a photon, it doesn't weigh anything. <laughs> Photons have no mass, and that is why you have never held a photon. So the idea of gravity as a thing that says, if you have an object of a lot of mass and an object of mass elsewhere, uh, gravity says in the classical picture of gravity, those two objects should be attracted to each other by a force. And only objects with mass uh, experience that force. So as, for example, you decrease the mass of an object, smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, it will experience less and less and less and less gravity until it gets to a mass of zero. And how much gravity should that experience? Well, zero, because it has no mass. That is still true in a sense and absolutely not true in a different sense, because as we found with general relativity, actually light does experience the effects of gravity, but it's through a different sort of mechanism than we thought. So what happens when we're talking about gravitational redshift is light that's emitted from the surface of an object that has a very intense gravitational potential well, uh, it will start out blue, but as it escapes that potential well and goes up to an observer that's very far away, that's not experiencing that gravity, it will actually get redder. It will become redshifted. And because gravity is responsible, we call this gravitational redshift. So why does this happen? And my favorite explanation for this is to do with time dilation. So here's what's happening. Time is actually moving slower inside the gravitational well. Here's the clock that we're using to measure the flow of time down here at the surface. As a result of this, an observer on the surface who is down here will observe the frequency of light as higher because their second is actually longer. So the same light wave moving in the same way after it gets out of the potential well and goes up to an observer up here where, it's, where there's not as much gravity 
will appear to be redshifted because between successive crests of this light wave, uh, less time passes. And so there are fewer of these things per second because the idea of a second is just faster when you're not in a very intense gravitational well. So this is mind bending, it's really abstract and it can be very hard to get used to. And that's why I like to talk about the pound Revka experiment. So here's what you should sort of compare this to is one of the first times that we, oh shoot, I'm a little bit cutting this off, I think with some of, uh, some of our faces. Okay, one of the first times that we ever observed the, uh, the first time that we ever observed the gravitational redshift effect was on an extremely dense star called a white dwarf. And that was called 40 Erdani B. And its density is roughly 1 million times the density of the sun. The reason is that this is that object. You can see it's very tiny. And this is actually what happens to stars like our sun after they die, after they sort of run out of fuel after millions or billions of years and uh, collapse into a very, very dense object that can't support itself anymore. So because of that, the surface, dent the, the surface gravity of this thing is very intense because it's so small and compact that all of the mass of this object is in one place. Uh, we did eventually in 1954, almost 40 years after the theory of relativity was first uh, theorized, finally observe this effect with a white dwarf. Unfortunately, the problem with astronomical objects and trying to observe this effect is that the densest astronomical objects are also the smallest. And so they're often the hardest to observe because they don't emit very much light. They don't have very much surface to emit light. So 40 or Donnie B is this beautiful little blue point of light next to this gigantic uh, white star called 40 or Donnie A. And 40 or Donnie A is very irritating if you're an astronomer because uh, it's in the way. It's this much brighter object that interferes with your observation of 40 or Donnie B. It took 40 years to get that technology to observe 40 or Donnie B well enough to observe the gravitational redshift. So the key thing uh, that scientists realized in that decade is that it might actually be easier to measure this effect on the surface of the Earth because the Earth is not next to 40 or Donnie A. There's nothing in the way, it's right there. So this is uh, really quick, if you have to choose a lab, this is one thing you can study. This is one thing you can obtain grant funding to study. This is another thing that you can obtain grant funding to study. Which one do you think is easier to study and costs less to observe? Uh, my money is on this second picture. And this is uh, Jefferson Laboratory at Harvard. So in 1959, Professor Robert Pound and graduate student Glenn Rebka Jr., the pound Rebka experiment namesake, proposed a way to measure the gravitational redshift on Earth. And it was in this building that they ended up doing it. Their plan was they were going to fire photons from the attic and then measure them in the basement. And if they had changed frequency at all, they had a way of basically measuring uh, exactly how much that was. And I'll get to exactly how much they changed frequency in a minute. It's a very, very small effect. And it's amazing they were able to see it at all. But uh, this is what the diagram of the experiment looked like. So Pound and Rebka essentially needed one thing to work very well. And that was that every single photon, every single like bit of light that they emitted from the attic needed to make it to the basement. Uh, and it needed to start with the same frequency every single time. That way that uh, they would know that if it had a different frequency than they expected in the basement, it was because of something that affected it on the way. It wasn't because of how it started. It was because of the gravitational redshift effect that sort of altered that uh, photon along the path to the basement. So to do this, they ended up using radioactive iron atoms and they strapped them to a speaker from the 1950s era. And the reason they did this is a little bit complicated and I can get into more of the sort of experiment design uh, if anyone is curious. So if you are, please ask a question about this experiment in the chat and I can maybe go into some more detail. The important part is that using this experimental setup, they were actually able to measure the frequency of arriving photons at the iron detector in the basement uh, that was only 75 feet below them, which in astronomy terms is basically equivalent to zero feet. It's not a distance. Uh, astronomers measure things in terms of light years, and this is not even a light uh, millisecond, as far as I remember. So uh, what did they end up finding when they when they measured the tiny changes in, in photon wavelength at the bottom of this building? And what they found was that, well, one second passed at the top of the building, one point I believe that's about 14 or 15 zeros and two five seconds pass at the top of the building. And that's a difference in two, of 2.5 parts in a quadrillion. So they did measure this effect to within about a 10% error. 
And later experiments, I think in the 90s and 2000s, actually constrained that to far less even. This is a very accurate measurement of exactly how much the gravitational redshift of Earth affects photons traveling from less gravity to more gravity or from more gravity to less gravity. So what this means is that the statement in the tagline of this video, that your head is moving faster through time than your feet, is quite literally true. And that is on the order of how much faster. It's not very much, but it is measurable and it is a real effect. So the last experiment I'll talk about, which is very brief because, uh, do either of you have a time check? Because you can't see a time on my computer at the moment. It is 8.35. Okay, so we're a little over time, so I'll just sort of jump through this because I think it's a really interesting experiment. But one of the more recent experiments that uh, tests one of the even harder effects of general relativity to test around the surface of the Earth was called Gravity Probe B. And uh, the tagline for that is the world's roundest man-made object. The reason I use that tagline is because the Guinness Book of World Records in 2004 assigned this experiment, uh, or rather a part of it, the award of most spherical man-made object of all time. Uh, essentially what this was is I, I was actually paging through the Guinness Book of World Records in 2004, 2005, and later in grad school, I was giving a talk on observational tests of relativity, and I heard Gravity Probe B, and I was like, that sounds familiar. Is that the world's most spherical man-made object? And it was, and it was awesome. So the point is, this is a very cool experiment just for the nature of how it was designed. Uh, they had to design a gyroscope that would go aboard this telescope. Uh, to measure an effect of general relativity that was so round that if you enlarge that sort of round ball to the size of the entire Earth, the largest hill on the ball would only be about six meters tall, if I remember right. So no Everests, no giant mountains, uh, not even a Kansas. It's it's literally so flat that you would not have a difference of even like one, you would barely have a difference of a few human heights over the entire surface of this ball. Uh, and they put this aboard a gigantic telescope with a lot more equipment, but this was sort of the key engine that was driving it. What they were trying to do was measure exactly how much this telescope rotated as it went around uh, the Earth in a series of orbits for a couple of years. And the reason they wanted to measure that is to constrain an effect called frame dragging. So this is a very strange diagram to show with, uh, with respect to this, but Essentially what happens is if you have a very massive object and it's rotating, it's spinning, then it actually spins or drags space time around with it. So what's considered like a normal uh, stationary sort of reference frame in space time is actually one that's spinning along with the planet. Essentially the mass of the planet is saying to space time, hey, you're going to come with me. <laughs> I'm going to sort of pull you along. Uh, it's a very abstract and difficult thing to visualize. So rather than visualize it, or uh, spend too much time on it. I'm just going to describe exactly how it affected this telescope that we really did put into space for a couple of years. And the way it affected it is we sent this telescope into orbit for a couple of years. And if gravity followed its sort of classical picture where there was no bending of space time, then after those couple of years, we know this telescope's hardware accurately enough that it would not have moved even a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a degree. Uh, and what actually happened is we measured this telescope's position in space by using a telescope that pointed at a guide star that we knew was stationary relative to how we saw it at Earth. And what we found was that the telescope had drifted this many degrees every single year of the experiment uh, in one direction and this many degrees in another. And these were both different types of precession, different effects from general relativity uh, that had to do directly with the curvature of space time. So essentially what this is saying is that if you send a telescope around the Earth one time and don't move it at all, it will naturally sort of end up pointing in a different direction, sort of like my hands are doing now. It's not moving, it's not rotating. It's just that it's moving through space that is not perfectly flat. And as a result, it sort of tilts a little bit in space. All right. Uh, that wraps up my portion of the talk, so that brings us to the Q&A. If anyone has uh, any interesting questions on this talk or about space in general, uh, please leave them in the chat. We are there to be your sort of resident space fanatics for the night. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. So, Avery, do we have any questions in the chat at the moment? As of now, no. <laughs> that's fine. So that's 
the th uh, after the Q and A as well is the sort of activity portion where we're introduced mm -hmm. some things to do. So if you're typing or if you're thinking, uh, take some time to do that. Uh, now might be a good time to move on to that actually if we don't have any questions immediately, and then we can sort of come back and do some Q and A. Absolutely, I think that's a great idea. All right, so um, I'm gonna stop sharing. I will just oh yeah, I don't even have to steal it from you. Okay, so I just. Uh, want to go over a little thing here. So this is uh, called Einstein's field equation. And essentially, it, it's a description of the energy, like essentially the energy and density. And essentially, you can pull pretty much every aspect of the universe, at least according to Einstein's general relativity from this equation. And the important thing that I want to mention, uh, just briefly before I go into any of the the multiple tabs that I have up here, as you can see, is uh, this little thing right here. Uh, and it's a capital lambda. And it essentially, it represents uh, dark energy, which I'll mention a little bit later. And it, this is just to show that uh, dark energy and its existence was predicted by general relativity. And I just wanted to point that out prior uh, to going into any of the more concrete things that I have up here. Uh, so firstly, uh, the first link in the description, I just have a basic sort of illustration of some effects of general relativity. So you can see that there's a, they call it a snake here, which passes in between two wedges, uh, which are shown as knives. So it makes it right in between these things. And if we change the perspective to the perspective of, of the snake, as opposed to uh, a stationary observer right here, what you can see is that it looks a lot different and the snake is much longer. So if we play it from the snake's perspective, it looks like the snake is sort of dodging something uh, going both ways as opposed to just dodging it up and down as we saw previously. So what this is essentially illustrating is the idea of uh, relative time experience and also relative, uh, uh, relative length. So yeah, uh, j just, a, just a pretty simple thing. Uh, there's a lot of different demos on this website, uh, but it sort of leads into the second thing, which if any of you like to play uh, web browser games, this might be fun for you, uh, is it's a uh, game which sort of shows how length contraction when uh, compared to the speed of light can sort of impact how we perceive the world. So down here in the bottom right, you can see that the speed of light is a lot slower than it is in our universe uh, by a factor of 10 to the eight meters per second. And essentially what that shows is that as we approach the speed of light, the world around us will contract and sort of slow down and speed up based on how fast we are actually going. And then to uh, just, a just a little warning for anyone who gets easily motion sick, uh, this is a little, this is a little bit, this is how we would actually see it if we were this velociraptor here. And it's, it's really crazy. Uh, anyway, it's a pretty interesting game. Uh, it's pretty long, but if any of you like browser games, feel free to go ahead and give it a try. It also illustrates sort of that idea of gravitational redshift or redshift in general uh, that Nico brought up. Uh, as you can see here, uh, it sort of hints at that. Here's another game. Uh, this one is by uh, the MIT Game Labs, and it's called a slower speed of light. So essentially, every time you pick up one of these balls, the speed of light gets slower. So you can essentially see that how colors would change if the speed of light was slower. And also the perspective of the player changes as well as you collect uh, the points and the speed of light gets slower. So both of these games sort of serve to provide an intuition into how uh, changing the aspects of our universe uh, could be to someone like us, or potentially if we are ever able to go close to the speed of light in spaceships or something, uh, it, it shows sort of a perspective as to how we would perceive the world from there. And then uh, I just have uh, this I'm not going to talk about. It's a pretty simple uh, gravitational lensing uh, simulator, which uh, you can see here is related to GR, but is also predicted without GR. Uh, if any of you are more analytical minded, you can sort of play around with it. It's essentially showing a galaxy here and a source back here, and it shows how it's lensed, uh, which is essentially 
as something comes around a large mass such as a galaxy, it can possibly create multiple images for an observer, say on Earth. And if you play, if you want to play around with any of the parameters of uh, the galaxy, you can do so. That's also in the link. You just have to click the download button here, I think. Yeah, something like that. And then two of the main things that I want to bring up are uh, Zooniverse. So Zooniverse is a citizen scientist project uh, that has I, many, many... Can I jump in really briefly and say that? Uh, are the links to these in the description of the video? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So this so is if you're the... looking for the links to these things, they're in the description of the video. Before yep. we go to one more, continue, sorry. Yeah, so if you just click the show more button on the bottom, uh, that's that's how you get there. So this is the Dark Energy Explorer Zooniverse link, and it's essentially asking you to uh, try and identify distant, distant, very distant galaxies. And the reason we want to do this is because we want to measure the redshift of these galaxies in order to nail down this value, the energy, the, the dark energy value in this uh, Einstein field equation here. So by doing this, you'll help uh, astrophysicists and physicists sort of nail down uh, a, a key aspect of our universe. And then here's a, a pretty cool and very fleshed out Zooniverse thing, uh, which is based around the observations of LIGO. And essentially what you can do is you can go through a, a total of seven different levels of uh, going through these observations. And one thing I do wanna mention is that these, this is actually real data that you'll be classifying. So as I go through here, you can see that uh, like this is a nearby galaxy or star because it's much, much bigger. This is maybe a distant galaxy or nothing. Anyway, uh, it's real data and you're actually doing real science if you are to go on Zooniverse and do this. Uh, it's pretty cool. And something like this is something which, it's a developing field, gravitational wave detection and stuff like that. Uh, anyway, it's, it's all very cool. I encourage you to do uh, any of these things above, especially the Zooniverse uh, stuff. And yeah, we do have a question. Uh, I believe it is for uh, Nico specifically. I can pull the uh, slide back up. But from Dar Daria Adams, she asks, uh, how can the guide star that you measure the telescope be unmoving? Isn't everything in space moving? It's funny because that's exactly what I thought when I was saying that. Uh, that was that was me trying to sort of wrap up the talk as, as uh, a bit quicker than I probably should have. So <laughs> really good catch. And that is exactly right. Everything in space is constantly moving. Uh, there is this really rapid speed with which uh, stars are orbiting the center of the Milky Way and are sort of moving randomly with respect to each other. And it's something like 300, uh, I believe it's 300 kilometers per second around the, the center of the Milky Way. Do I have the order of magnitude right? Yeah, Order of magnitude is good. <laughs> yeah, so it's like 200 or 300 kilometers every single second uh, that the sun is moving around the center of the Milky Way. Uh, I am Pegasi, this other star, is moving at a slightly different speed. So it is moving a little bit with respect to the sun. Uh, luckily, it is also so far away from us that we can constrain using the rules of general relativity how much we think this telescope is going to sort of change its pointing every year because of the effects that we're trying to measure. And it's a couple of uh, I believe 10 thousandths or 100 thousandths of a degree in each direction. Uh, on the other hand, this star, I am Pegasi, is actually going to move even less than that because we know its motion extremely well. And the amount that is going to move for this experiment is essentially zero. So really what I should have said is that star is staying so still in the sky relative to how we see it and relative to the time of the experiment that we can use it to do something like this. So it's sort of like using a table to stabilize like as you saw, like a like a wooden block. Like if you just did it in the air, it'd be a mess. If you stabilize it against the table, the table's not perfectly stable, but it's enough. It's just enough that you can that you can get it done. This star is just stable enough that we can get the experiment done. It'll help you do it within margin of error. One might say. exactly. All right. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to drop them in the chat. Um,
while we're waiting, I just thought of, it's one of my favorite things in space and I, I, I had to bring it up. Um, you might be wondering how we measure that velocity of us relative to the galaxy that we're moving on 200 to 300 kilometers per second. And I love it because it's through commonly 21 centimeter hydrogen, which is a emission line that you might guess is 21 centimeters long. And the one of the reasons why it was discovered was there was a bunch of really, really bad telescopes left over from the world wars. I say really, really bad because they weren't meant to be telescopes. They were meant to receive radio signals, but what is, but that means they're meant to receive signals that are very, very long. So they don't have to be great. They can be just a little rinky dink. And some professors wanted to use these telescopes in some meaningful way without throwing them away. So they asked their grad student, hey, could you figure out a new emission line, which if you know some science is not an easy undertaking. And they ended up discovering 21 centimeter hydrogen. We're able to measure this really well because it just doesn't really hit anything. So that's how we figure out the speed of, the, of ourselves relative to the center of the galaxy. And I thought I'd uh, mention that because I find it just absolutely fascinating that something is 21 centimeters long and it's light. Thank you for what was honestly a fascinating history lesson. I was not aware of that. So it looks like we have a, another question uh, from Dick Hendrickson asking, if I throw a baseball upwards, it loses energy as it goes up. If a photon goes upward, it loses energy and thus becomes redder. Is that the same as warp? Is, is that the same as, say, a warped space time effect? It is and it isn't. Uh, so I'm tempted to say that yes, it is. I think, it's, I think it could be equivalently explained by the photon losing energy as it goes up. Uh, I don't have the map in front of me, but I think that is an, an alternate explanation. So yeah, what I wanted, one thing I wanted to say is there are actually a lot of different ways to explain this effect. We could consider it, we could calculate the amount of gravitational redshift that happens by uh, doing a time dilation sort of argument and doing the math of how much time dilation is there between point A where the photon leaves and point B where it arrives. Uh, and Dick Henderson has brought up another actually very valid way of doing that, which is you can calculate the potential energy of how much energy does something that is down here in the, in the, in the potential well have when it's up here in space. Uh, I think that's a little trickier and it may not be a perfect analogy to use potential energy when it comes to photons because the energy of a baseball as it leaves the potential well affects uh, whether or not it's able to escape. The energy of a photon doesn't affect whether it's able to escape or not. What matters is that uh, all photons of any energy can escape uh, from the same sort of gravitational well. Uh, and the reason that I know that is that a black hole, which has famously has this event horizon from which nothing can escape, uh, has, this, has this one event horizon, like the one, the one line basically where uh, anything that, any photon that's emitted from closer to the center of the black hole from that line will never be able to escape because it doesn't have enough sort of energy. Any photon emitted from beyond that line can escape. So it's not quite like throwing a baseball because it doesn't matter how much, you, how, how much energy the baseball has, any baseball can escape from outside the event horizon of a black hole and none can escape from inside no matter how hard you throw it. So that's why I think it's a little bit different, but uh, I've also seen some of the energy of, uh, some of the math of potential energy applied to photons escaping from gravitational redshift wells. So you're onto something is my point. And I'm, I'm confusing myself as I talk about it. So that is the extent of my knowledge, but thank you for asking. Yeah, and if we were to use just Newtonian gravity on a photon, uh, our problem would be that photons don't have any mass. So, but they do have effective mass. So, yeah. Uh, we have Jeff Ridley who asks, how far does a light source need to be where the expansion of space time makes it appear to exceed the speed of light? And I did a quick calculation on my uh, calculator here. And it's about uh, 4,300,000 uh, megaparsecs away based on if we take the Hubble constant to be uh, 70 uh, kilometers per second per oh no it would be smaller than that because that's not meters per second it would be oh, no, that is that is about right 
I think it's 4,000 megaparsecs. Yeah, something like that. It, it would be a factor of three less than what I said. Yeah, like three zeros less. The reason that I know that, and the reason that I can confirm that that's right, is that is the exact size of the what's called the observable universe. And it's called the observable universe because everything outside of it is expanding away from us so quickly that light cannot make it to us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Jeff, you have defined the edge of the observable universe with that question, and great job. Uh, that's that's basically why we looking out into space means that we're looking back in time. Is that uh, well, no, that's a bit different. Sorry, uh, that's why we can only look back uh, a certain distance in time. We're actually limited by uh, redshift. So as things become redshifted to sort of an infinite degree, as their light becomes so stretched out that it's just not light anymore, that it has no energy at all, and its uh, sort of peaks are separated by an infinite distance, that's the point past which we can't observe the universe. And uh, it's why astronomers actually define distance in terms of redshift, in terms of how quickly things are moving away from us. Because uh, at redshift sort of infinity, when things are infinitely redshifted, we can't see them anymore. And just before that is we're sort of observing the very beginning of the universe. And it's as far, it's objects as far away from us as we can possibly observe. Yeah. And going back to uh, the Zooniverse thing, that's sort of what you're looking at uh, in this uh, dark energy explorers thing, because you're trying to define that expansion of the universe. So what you're doing is you're looking way, 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 way back into the early, early history of the universe, right as galaxies were first forming at very high redshift objects here. So, yeah. Good hey, question. Quick, quick round of applause for me about uh, how quickly you got that number, by the way. I feel like I didn't say, I didn't emphasize that enough when I was sort of jumping in with my part of the answer and you deserve some kudos there. That was really impressive. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Reese fan, so no plonk here. <laughs> Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, that's just uh, how I'm defining the Hubble constant. Because, oh, that's really funny. Yeah. You get different values based on how you measure it. And that's a, that's a big no-no in science. So trying to we figure could, out. We could and probably should do a whole universe at home just about the Hubble constant and then the Hubble constant tension. Because mm. there is enough content there. It's, it's a fascinating topic that we don't fully understand even as scientists yet. I prefer the lensing one just because I think lensing is cool. <laughs> no, but uh, Jeff's question reminded me of, of another side note. Um, there are objects that we observe that do appear to be going faster than the speed of light that aren't out at that uh, final horizon, and that's blazars. So when we have two blazars pointing directly at us, well, I should, what they are is basically a massive jet and in very layman terms, it's been a while since I've studied this, but the point is, is when they're pointed at us and they're moving away from each other, we can determine their distance from each, from each other as going faster than the speed of light. And that actually has absolutely nothing to do with relativity. Um, they are typically going at fast enough to include relativity, but the fact that they appear to be moving away from each other faster than the speed of light is just due to the geometry of the system. So it's one of those peculiar things in space where, yes, relativity affects a lot of things, but we have other scenarios where we have to come up with some explanation because we just, we cannot break the law of no going faster than the speed of light. Too many things would break. And it, I, I've, I've studied way too much for those things to break. Yeah, I think, I think this is a case where uh, you can sort of appear to break the laws of physics if you're not looking closely. If you take, if you have a very powerful arm, you can throw a baseball in one direction at 98% of the speed of light. And then you can turn around, you can throw another baseball also in the opposite direction at also 98% the speed of light. And from your perspective, the relative speed of those two baseballs is 196% of the speed of light. The reason that uh, doesn't actually pan out, the reason that they're not, they don't observe each other to be going that fast is because of the way that time sort of dilates itself when objects are moving really fast. So both of those baseballs observe each other to be moving really quickly, really close to the speed of light, but they perceive time to be moving differently. So they basically time slows down just enough that the other baseball is not moving faster than the speed of light relative to itself. I think that's what you're describing, right, Maxwell? Or is that something different? It, that's exactly what I'm describing. It's, okay. a, it's a little different, but yes, it is the, the general idea that, yeah, if you're not careful, 
you'll end up coming to grandiose conclusions that are just not correct. <laughs> So we have uh, oh, a couple more questions uh, from Mike. Can frame dragon be quantified based on mass? Uh, and just looking at this equation, uh, the, the frame dragging procession specifically, I believe, Nico, I don't know if you, you probably know more about this than I do. Uh, let me enlarge the screen because I need to take another look at this equation. I was going to point to, hey, yeah, this is where mass shows up in the equation, but it's not obvious. It I, is in there, though. Mm -hmm. uh, is I the moment of inertia? So, what, yeah, what's happening is that uh, frame dragging precession depends on how much mass there is and how fast it's rotating. And I kind of captures both of those things. It says uh, how much mass is there relative to like where it is uh, uh, next to the Earth's axis of rotation. So it's a really sort of, it's when you're not applying it to frame dragon precession, it's one of those physics concepts that you can learn in like a high school physics class. It's just called the moment of inertia. And if I spin around in my chair and I do this, I have a high moment of inertia. If I spin around like this, I have a low moment of inertia. And it measures sort of how much mass there is and how far away it is from the center of rotation. Uh, but between those two things, yeah, mass does show up in this equation. And the more mass there is and the further away it is from the moment of, uh, from the axis of rotation, the more frame dragging per session you'll have. So mass can quantify it. It's uh, frame dragging is exactly proportional to mass if you just increase it without changing anything else. Great. Uh, so Dick Hendrickson has another question. Uh, why would the Hubble constant be a constant? If the early universe was turbulent, couldn't different regions appear to be moving at a different speed? Um, so the Hubble constant, the derivation for the Hubble constant uh, is, it has to do with how the universe is expanding. So it, it has to do with the, the, what's called the scale radius and uh, the changing of the scale radius. So if we take another derivative of that, the acceleration of the scale or scale length, I guess, not scale radius, my bad. Um, it, 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 it really just, it would depend. And it, it isn't necessarily a constant currently because as you say, if, Earth, if the early universe was turbulent, well, the universe doesn't expand everywhere. It only expands in places where there are not high like areas of mass. Uh, so we on earth are not necessarily moving away from the sun all that much because we're at a relatively high density. Um, at least that's my understanding of it. Uh, yeah, I can, I can back that up. It's the, all of space time, if there was nothing in it, would be expanding at the same rate, we think. But there is stuff in it. And anywhere that there's a lot of stuff, like a galaxy or a solar system, uh, gravity kind of slows the expansion of space time because it, it curves the space time that it's in. And it, it sort of alters the way that it expands. But otherwise, yeah, it's, it, it, if there was nothing in the universe, if it was completely empty of matter and, and radiation, it would all be expanding at exactly the same rate, is, is the general theory. That connects into one of the theories for the end of the universe, which is the big rip. Um, the idea that if that expansion does exceed the kind of potential energy that's holding together these systems, then it can start to tear them apart. Um, which is a fun idea of dark energy is that dark energy could potentially cause this in the future because dark energy is a constant um, energy density in the universe. And if, it's, if it becomes high enough compared to your local, your potential that's holding you together, then it will tear you apart. Thankfully, that's not happening right now, as Nico mentioned. Yeah, and just to sort of wrap up that, we haven't proved necessarily that it isn't a constant. But if we proved it wasn't a constant, then general relativity would be wrong, I'm pretty sure. That is true, yeah. That would be a very, very groundbreaking, yeah. earth-shaking, physics-destroying realization at this point. Because all of our understanding of physics today and the way the universe works is sort of wrapped up in a field called cosmology. And cosmology is partly based on the assumption that space has this thing that powers its expansion that we call dark energy. 
and that dark energy is exactly the same everywhere. So if there were differences at different places in the universe that were significant enough to measure, uh, cosmology would basically fall apart. And I think we've, we've confirmed a lot of the theories of cosmology now to the point where we are pretty sure that the universe has a uniform expansion speed, but it, there could be slight differences. That's, al that's always a possibility. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's uh, 9.04. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to drop them in, the, in these last minutes. Otherwise, we'll probably uh, wrap up pretty soon. On the topic of groundbreaking physics, I was reading a theory that has yet to be fully tested and, you know, articles like to make them grandiose, but it was introducing the idea that dark matter could potentially have a magnetic component and that could account for the effects that we attribute to dark energy, which if for those viewing dark energy, dark matter, completely different things, we just like to be confusing. Um, dark just stands for we don't really know. Um, but uh, I thought that that was quite peculiar that dark matter, if it had this magnetic component to it, um, which I personally don't like that theory. I like the current theory of dark matter. Um, then we could throw dark energy out the window and we would have a bunch of new physics to figure out. When you say magnetic component, does that just mean it has like a, like each one has like a magnetic field of some kind or? My understanding of it was that, yeah. Which, yeah, I, knowing what I know about galactic evolution, which to be fair, isn't a heck of a lot, but that just doesn't feel right. We would see dark matter cool down faster if that was the case, at least. I, I'm sure many other effects would occur. Yeah, it's, my, that, that surprises me just because I know that we do have telescopes that have measured magnetic fields and I don't really know those results for this, this, I, the running joke that I know of about magnetic fields and galaxies is that if anyone incites magnetic fields or invokes magnetic fields as an explanation for something everyone else just kind of nods and just kind of moves on because they're very scary and difficult and complicated and uh it's a very specialized sort of tool set that you need to understand them that most astronomers don't have so me included and I think uh most of the people I work with included so and they're they're very expensive to simulate they're very that expensive. Me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so astronomers who already are sort of uh, very strapped for cash might not want to spend it all on simulating magnetic fields and galaxies. <laughs> all right, so I think we'll probably uh, end the stream for tonight. I hope you all had a good time learning about general relativity with us. And uh, hope you tune in in two weeks for the next iteration of Universe at Home. Uh, I'm just pulling up the website here. Uh, you can go down uh, to the very sort of bottom of the page. Uh, this is also in the video description as well. And uh, it, the very last one for this semester on April 28th is going to be with uh, Bob, Alexander, and Anne talking about what's this universe thing made of anyway. All right, are we ready to end the stream? I believe so. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and have a great night.